Greetings all, Ferrari Man 601 here. Welcome back to another 118th scale model car review of this, the 1980 Renault RE20 by Exotto. This is one of the older cars in the 118th scale collection. It's uh, certainly one of the older Formula One cars that I've got being from 1980. I've got a couple older than this, but this one is pretty long in the tooth in terms of years elapsed from whence it competed. But this is a very interesting car and it talks about two very pertinent and important things in modern day motorsport, believe it or not. We'll take a close look at this one coming up. The Renault RE20 and RE20B, they are the Formula One cars with which the Renault Formula One team competed in the 1980 and 1981 Formula One World Championships. It was driven in principle by Jean-Pierre Jabouy, Alain Prost, and René Arnoux, an all-French lineup for the all-French Renault team. Renault in these days, they were making big waves in the world of Formula One because they were the first team to introduce turbocharging, at least turbocharging as we now know it in the modern era. We're not talking about the supercharged pre-war Grand Prix cars from Auto Union and the like. Those things were absolute monstrosities. This is turbocharging in the sense that we have a turbine driven by exhaust pressure coming out of the engine and then running a secondary turbine to ram air into the intake plenum on top of the engine to generate more power. Of course, we do have the magic triangle in terms of internal combustion engines. You need fuel, you need an ignition source, and you need an oxidizer. In other words, you need an intake of ambient air in order to support that combustion. The more air that you throw at anything that's burning, the more oxygen in particular, the better it burns in terms of burning hotter, cleaner, more efficiently, and this of course is exactly the same when we're talking about combustion engines. Those of you who are into aviation or spaceflight, you'll know all about jet engines and their efficiency. Obviously they generate more power close to sea level at cooler temperatures when the air is denser and as the jet engine goes up higher in altitude it starts to become less efficient because it has less oxygen available to it. Of course there's more into the equation than that and a lot goes into jet engine design nowadays to make sure that they're optimized to be running at cruising altitudes but it's the same principle when it comes to a, an internal combustion piston engine. The more air you can throw at it, the more effectively and efficiently it's going to be able to utilize its fuel, meaning it's going to generate more power and burn less fuel doing it. That is the overall macrocosmic rationale of turbocharging, and Renault were the first team to introduce turbocharging as we now know it into Formula One. They did that with the Renault RS1, the little yellow teapot that those of you who are Formula One historians may know about. This is not the, the little yellow teapot. This is one of its immediate successors, the RE20. This car designed by Renault for the 1980 World Championship by Francois Castan and Michel Tetu. Of course, all French designers as well for the all French team. And of course, they took a lot of pride in being Renault and they took a lot of pride also in pioneering this turbo technology. The car's immediate predecessor was the RS10 of 1979, and uh, by most intents and purposes, it actually looks quite similar to the RS10, but a few significant improvements were made. This is 1980, though, so this is right at the dawn of carbon composites. McLaren were the first team to introduce carbon composites into Formula One. Renault were behind the curve on that, so you will not find carbon fiber anywhere on this car. Rather than the present-day carbon monocoque construction, this one has an aluminum monocoque construction, so it is all formed and bent sheets of aluminum, which are then riveted and welded together, depending on where they are on the car. So it is very much conventional construction, not all that different from space frame construction that you'd still see on modern road cars. In terms of overall dimensions, again, this is a departure from the modern era. The regulations were nowhere near as standardized as they are today in terms of the teams having to fit into a very precisely prescribed template. So our dimensions on this car are as follows. The axle track at the front, 1,720 millimeters. At the rear, a little bit narrower, 1,630 millimeters. For a total wheelbase of 2,860 millimeters. So significantly shorter than a modern Formula One car by about a meter and change, but still for the day a pretty wide and long car. 
Also, you've got to remember refueling wasn't a thing yet in Formula One. It had really yet to be invented as far as the modern pit stop was concerned. So tire changes only in this era. The cars, of course, were carrying their entire race load of fuel from the green flag. Powering this car, yes, as we mentioned, it is a turbo engine, and you can see a glimpse of it there underneath the rear bodywork. It is the Renault Gordini EF1 1,492cc V6 twin turbo engine. Renault, again, pioneering turbocharging V6 engines, just like we see today in modern Formula One, as well as an IndyCar. This engine looking a bit more similar to a modern IndyCar engine than it does to a Formula One engine, being that it is a twin turbo rather than a single turbo. However, one and a half liters displacement, only slightly smaller than the 1.6 liter modern Formula One V6. Longitudinally mounted, that engine is, of course. However, I don't believe it to be a stressed member in the construction of this car. We'll take a look at that once we take the bodywork off. The transmission in this, here is the wonderful days of old, a Hewland FGA 400 five-speed manual. Yep, three pedals and a stick, that is what a race car should be. So a straight up five-speed manual just like you'd find in many road cars today. Fuel supplied by ELF, as you can see there on the side of the car, and the tires are Michelin, as you might expect, French drivers, French team, French designers, and French tires. Competition history on the RE20. Notable entrance, of course. The Renault Formula One team, driven by Jean-Pierre Jabouille, Alain Prost, and René Arnoux, as we have seen. It debuted at the 1980 Argentine Grand Prix. Out of 20 races over two seasons in which it competed, it won three of them, took five pole positions, and four fastest laps. However, it was unable to take the Constructors' or Drivers' Championship in either one of its two years in competition. Be that as it may, though, this car is a very technically interesting one. It may not be the most illustrious when it comes to competition history, but as we're moving forward into another decade of motorsport, some of us are starting to revisit the past a little bit more intently and look at some of the engineering solutions that designers of yesteryear came up with. And this car, using very two, two very pertinent design attributes that may well make a comeback come the next decade. We mentioned turbocharging, but the second one that we must mention ground effect. You can see on this car, we have front and rear wings, yes, but relative to what we see nowadays, they are very small and rather insignificant. The rear wing, of course, is pretty large in terms of its overall shape here. However, the main plane on that rear wing is a little bit shallow. It's not at all what you would expect to see from a modern Formula One wing. So what gives? Well, Notice the side pod design on this car, or generally speaking, lack of side pods on this car, depending on your perspective. This is a wing car. It is a ground effect wing car. The entire car is a wing car. Yes, indeed. This, utilizing Bernoulli's principle and the Venturi effect, you can see underneath there, we'll take a closer look at this later, we have what appears to be a flat bottom, but uh, no, it's not. There are two absolutely massive tunnels running underneath either side of this car along the side pods there. If we want to call them side pods, they're really just little skirt valances. And that is what is generating the vast majority of this car's downforce. Yes, ground effect, the suck principle. It doesn't suck. It sucks so hard that it's good. Indeed. This may well be making a comeback in Formula One come 2021 or so, if some of the prototype renderings are to be believed. So, yeah, ground effect. Of course, that was pioneered by Lotus with their Type 78 and 79 chassis from the late 70s. But, of course, very quickly, Formula One being the exercise in industrial espionage that it is, everybody else immediately started to decide, hey, we've got to copy what Lotus are doing, and we, too, must tame ground effects. That's exactly what happened. By 1980, ground effect was in full force in Formula One, and you could see it on pretty much every single car that was competing over the course of that year. The RE20, of course, included amongst those. Basically, what happens underneath this car is you have a very low front end, as you can see there, and the center line of the car is also very low, but laterally on either side, and if we go above, you can see this a little bit more clearly. If you go above there, you can see that the sides of that car around the midsection, they're very wide. They're almost as wide as the width of the axles. The reason for that is in the center line of that car, we have ourselves a big empty space. 
to either side of dead center down the middle. What that allows to happen is for air passing underneath the very low fronts of that uh, side pod valance structure, it allows that air to slow down a little bit and to expand as it goes underneath the car. When air expands in a confined space, its pressure drops, meaning that you create a suction effect underneath the center of that car, and of course, when it comes shooting out the back end of said car, it expands even further, and what that all conspires to do is to create a big down load acting on the underside of the car, affecting the top side of the car, meaning that you get compression and you get grip. Yes, ground effect downforce, this is what the name of the game was in 1980, and that's exactly what Renault are doing with this car. Some of the benefits of ground effect are that you don't need very large front and rear wings to generate a lot of grip, nor are you going to be generating a lot of turbulence out the back, as you also see from more conventional top side wings, because the air doesn't really have to be bent around so much as it's going underneath the car. Rather, it's just slowing down and expanding. So, yes, you do, of course, get a low pressure zone behind the car, which affects the car generating it as drag, but it gives a big slipstream to a car behind, but it does not really give so much turbulence. Formula One's current issues of dirty air, which attempted once again to be addressed in 2019, and once again it appears that they have failed. They're failing because they're still dealing with topside aero. IndyCar is not dealing so much with topside aero anymore, and we see the racing is generally pretty good wherever that championship goes. So Formula One, perhaps you should be taking a page out of your old rulebook and putting some ground effect on these cars. The downside to ground effect, though, at least as we saw it in the late 70s and early 80s, was that the cars were becoming so fast through the corners that they were truly exceeding the capacities of the circuits to absorb the energy if one of these cars got involved in an accident. Of course, in these days, we still, for the most part, had unprotected steel barriers lining racetracks. We didn't really either have uh, the sorts of medical equipment that we have nowadays at, at uh, most circuits, meaning that if a big accident happened, plus you got to remember these cars are still made out of sheet aluminum, we don't have carbon monocoques yet, it's not going to be a good day. The circuits didn't have the capacity to deal with accidents at those speeds, nor was the medical technology up to par, nor was the technology of the cars up to par to be dealing with accidents like that. So, the FIA said we have to ban ground effects in principle, we have to ban these skirts that come down from the sides of the car and seal those tunnels underneath, keeping the air from spilling out and creating inefficiencies. The teams lost a whole lot of downforce once they were no longer able to seal the undertrays of these cars, and that's why ultimately they decided to move toward topside wings, which we have seen forever more. But these days, with better circuits, with better medical technology, with better technology in terms of car design and driver safety, ground effect could well make a comeback, and of course we would reap all the benefits of it, and try to negate as much as possible the potential risks. That's my little bit of preaching for this video, but now let's take a closer look at this absolutely wonderful Renault. This model brought to us by Exato. Of course, Exato, they tend to be rare, they tend to be exclusive, and they tend to be very nicely detailed. And that, of course, is also the case with this RE20. I've had this one for quite a while. I want to say for about five or six years. It uh, was not my first Exato model, but it was, uh, I believe it was the second one that I ever got. The first one goes to my uh, Williams FW14B. But... Being an Exoto, you know that you should expect good things, and generally speaking, we have very good things on this model. The entire car is die-cast metal. There are some plastic parts, namely the front and rear wings, some of the little aero appendages on the back sides of the side pods there, these little black triangular winglets you can see here, but we have a very good construction on this thing, very good design all around. There's the front wing. You can see that the left side, car left side, winglet element there on that wing is a little bit upturned and that's how it came. It's a very thin piece of plastic so I suppose we can excuse that. I can make up a little story and say that René Arnoux 
his name's on the side there, he uh, hit a curb a little bit too hard and he slightly bent his wing. So no matter, it all works. And of course that front wing, not really doing all that much in terms of downforce anyway. So I think we can excuse that on the downforce being generated by the underside as we have already discussed. But very nice detail all around on this car. I really like the rear zone on this one. As we get a little bit closer in here, you can see all kinds of detail going on in the back. There are your four exhaust pipes, two for the engine itself, one for each bank of three cylinders each, and then two for turbocharger wastegates, because of course we do have two turbochargers on this wonderful little car. Going up top here, there's the cockpit. Get some light in there. Yep. Pretty basic and very crude by modern standards, but that is what you would have expected to see in a race car in early 1980, and that's exactly what you've got. You've got nice seat belt detail there, their actual fabric with photo etch buckles, as you would expect. Nice Willens uh, decaling there on the seat belts as well. And there's the side of the bulkhead. You can see little rivet heads in there, and of course, a manual gear lever that is what you'd expect an aluminum monocoque and then a five speed manual H pattern gearbox. Absolutely love it. This would be a fun car to drive, especially when the turbochargers kick in and you start to get about 550 horsepower up your backside in a car that weighs, well, not all that much, about 620 kilograms all fueled and ready to go. So even though it is quite old at this point, it still is lighter than a modern Formula One car interesting little note. Of course, it's nowhere near as fast through the corners because, well, downforce and tire technology and everything else nowadays. But this thing must have been absolutely insane to drive in its day simply because of the explosive nature of those turbochargers kicking in. They didn't have the anti-lag systems that the teams run today, nor did they have any hybrid systems, of course. So when the power came on, it was fully on. And, th and then when these drivers got off of the throttle, well, they were really off of it and they had no power whatsoever. If you listen to drivers who uh, drove in this era, you listen to them talk about how these cars behaved. Basically, they had to pick a spot on the horizon, slam the gas down, count to three, and then hang on tight. Such was the turbo lag in this era. But once the power came in, they really had a job just to keep these things pointing in the right direction, even in a straight line. Because of course, being rear-wheel drive, even though those rear tires are quite massive, even by modern standards, they could break traction very easily in which case you could be having a bad day. So definitely you need some fortitude to be driving these things and uh, maybe a little bit of skill would go a long way as well. Of course, many of the guys, I would venture to say all of the guys who managed to be competitive in this era certainly would have been gladiators. So yes. Anyway, some more closer details on the car. You notice here front suspension. Look at what you don't see. You don't see push rods or anything. In fact, you see a very conventional, almost road car type setup. You have a lower strut array, making up your lower control arm or lower wishbone. And then on the top side of the suspension, you've got yourself this little triangular upper wishbone. It is not separate elements. It doesn't have its own little spindly elements as you would see in modern Formula One suspension. That's just a big wedge of steel and that's taking a lot of the load and then transmitting it into the inboard horizontally mounted dampers in the front end, which actually work on this model. We'll show you that. Rear suspension, similar situation. It is a double wishbone, but it's not push rod or pull rod. It is a double wishbone multi-link rear suspension. Again, somewhat similar to what you would see on many road cars, particularly of this era. Really interesting to see that, and uh, of course, uh, that suspension works as well on this model, but really that's one of the areas where Formula One design has really taken off in the last few decades. We've got carbon suspension nowadays, push rod or pull rod, usually it's pull rod on the rear end now, but very conventional A-arm, control arm, whatever you want to call it, and then a multi-link setup on this car with dampers mounted in board. Very, very cool to see that evolution in design. Also on this car, you don't see all the little winglets and flick-ups and everything else that you'd see. You even have an exposed engine and gearbox on the back of this thing. Again, these cars were not dealing with the same sorts of high speeds in terms of going over 200 miles an hour on a routine basis at most circuits, so they weren't as concerned with drag. Of course, they had a lot of power, and later on in the Turbo Era, they'd have about twice as much power as this one does, so they really weren't concerned with drag. But again, when was the last time you saw a Formula One team running with an exposed engine on purpose? A long, long time ago, so 
that's uh, a little bit more evolution to look at for you here. Of course, on this car, we do also have some removable bodywork, uh, so we shall be removing that presently. Of course, the top side section of the bodywork, pretty much the entire length of the car, does come away. It's going to be a beep in a moment. There we go. So, we just grab up here, and uh, we appropriately lift and finagle and make sure that we don't rip anything off, and there it goes. We set that aside, and now we'll take a look at what's going on here. Immediately, you can see that some of what we see in modern race car design does carry over to this one all the way back in 1980, but there are also quite a few very large distinctions. Namely, look at the cockpit and look at where it is relative to the rest of the car. In particular, look at the front axle line pretty much right up there where we're panning, and look at where the footwell is. Yeah, so driver's legs are well ahead of the center line of the front axle. This, of course, is very much prohibited nowadays because if you had a front end collision in a car like this, guess what's going to be absorbing most of that impact energy? Yes, the driver, Martin Brundle, will tell you all about what it's like to crash in a car of this particular vintage. It's not very much fun. Johnny Herbert also falling victim to that. A number of other drivers, those are the most famous ones I can recall at the moment. But certainly no, not a good idea to have an accident, especially a frontal one, in a car like this. And of course, uh, moving the cockpit arrears of the front axle center line, that is something that has been later addressed in the regulations to improve driver safety. But we've also got some other things going on in this frontal zone of the car. Yes, we've got the front axle, and there is the pedal box inside. We do have some pedals detailed in there. It's a little bit difficult to see, trying to get the light in there, but that's uh, what we've got going on inside. That is your pedal box. And additionally, we have got some linkages for the front suspension, which are actually articulated. We uh, push on the front end of the chassis in a strategic location, and you can see there the front suspension deflecting a bit in there as the car goes up and down on either side. Very cool to see all of that. Uh, it's always a cool treat to see a model with working mechanical details like this front suspension here, like uh, just how you can see that pivot with uh, the little push rod there going down and uh, absorbing that uh, energy, putting it into the shock, the spring shock there in the center of the car. Also linking up the front suspension, if you could see here, this is a little bit of a torsion bar. Get some light on there for you. Yep, torsion bar giving you your front end roll stiffness. Very cool. Additionally on this, you can see that we have steering linkage on this car right uh, pretty much in their center of screen. There is your steering linkage, and the uh, steering is, of course, operable on this car. There's a little bit of play in it on this particular bottle, but yes, you can see that we do have operable steering on this car. It's a little bit difficult to do it without moving the car uh, backwards or forwards a little bit just to relieve some of that static friction, but yes, we do have operable steering, and if we grab one of the front wheels, you can see that happening a little bit uh, more clearly there. Very cool. Also, in terms of cockpit detail, we'll get the car to spin again. Beep incoming. Get a little bit more going on. There's our front suspension going by and our pedal box moving rearward. There is the big uh, A-pillar, if you would like. Not really an A-pillar in terms of automotive parlance, but you can see what's going on with this car here. There's your steering wheel, replete with all of zero buttons. That's the way it should be, very much a purist. Uh, type of cockpit layout. There's your gear lever there on the side for your five-speed Hewlin gearbox, and then of course you've got controls for uh, fire extinguishers and of course controlling the turbo boost pressure. Moving down a little bit, if we can get the light in the right spot, you can see that we have got an actual gauge in there. That's a tachometer mounted front and center for the driver to be addressing. This engine be revving up to about 12,000 RPM, I would reckon. And of course, with the driver having to three pedal it all the way around, he'd definitely be wanting to know what his revs are for fear of launching the engine. Moving rearward here to the sides of the car, here's something a little bit more conventional. There are the radiators, and uh, on this model, there are an actual photo etched metallic radiator matrix in there. No stickers or decals whatsoever. That's all actual metal replicating the radiators. And back here, you can see intercoolers cooling down that intake air as the turbochargers have compressed it. And of course, when you compress air, it heats up exponentially. So intercoolers there just trying to cool down that inlet charge before it goes into the engine because cooler air means denser air, which means you get more bang for your buck. 
Moving uh, slightly forward again, there is your fuel tank, very large fuel tank, and relative to a modern car, it's mounted in more or less a conventional position, right back of the cockpit and right in front of the engine. Pretty large fuel tank. Fuel tank's roughly twice the size of the engine itself, because remember, a complete Grand Prix distance had to be done on that one tank of fuel. You can see some breathers here and fill valves for that fuel tank. Very cool. And on top, believe it or not, this is a computerized control box. Yes computers making an appearance on a race car. Of course, uh, this probably had about five bytes of memory and uh, had no solid state whatsoever uh, if it ever shut off, but hey, there it is, just to monitor performance of the Renault Gordini 1.5 liter V6, which is right here. Nice signature blue cam covers there, and there are your spark plugs and plug wires coming down from the distributor going into each of the three cylinders on here, the left-hand bank, and of course three others on the right-hand bank. Also on top, you've got this intake plenum. This one, you can see how strongly welded it is there. Lots and lots of inlet pressure going on in that plenum. You can see a little relief valve there in case things got to an overpressure situation. Probably running about three bar of boost. That's three times atmospheric pressure. So, yep, that's pretty, pretty high up. Of course, engines very similar to this one were the famous ones uh, that were those single lap qualifying specials coming into 1985, 1986, which were running five and a half bar boost pressure for one lap before the engines departed this earth. Very similar design here in 1980. Of course, I'm talking about the Lotus 97 and 98T that uh, Ayrton Senna took so many pole positions in. Yep. Very similar type of engine here. Top side of the engine, you can see wonderful plumbing in terms of the air inlets and the fuel lines and uh, all of that as well. Of course, this would be fuel injected in this era. No carburetors anymore. Moving back here, this looks like uh, either an auxiliary fuel tank or more likely an oil tank. And then the back side of the engine is really nestled in there behind the, uh, the uh, little uh, shafts here, I believe, linking the uh, inlet sides of the turbochargers together, or perhaps that's just a stiffening strut. Not entirely sure what that long bar is between the turbochargers, but there it is, oil tank in all likelihood. Just to rears of the oil tank, still roughly center line of the car, there are the uh, linkages for the rear shocks. And uh, again, if we press on the car, you can see, hopefully, that we can get some deflection going on. Yeah, a little bit there on the right-hand side. A little bit of deflection going on through the multi-link rear suspension. So again, another articulated component of this car. Actually functional. Very nice to see all of that. Of course, we have got exhaust pipes here out the back, just coming straight up out the top underneath the rear wing. Those two larger pipes, that's for the engine exhaust. That's uh, coming straight out of the uh, compressor side of the uh, turbo, the exhaust-driven compressor side. And then, of course, we have turbo waste gates on either side of that, the two smaller pipes. Very nice to see. Unlike uh, some other Exoto models there, these pipes are not done in metal. They are done in plastic. They're finished nicely, but they're not done in metal. But uh, interesting to see nonetheless. Coming uh, down and slightly outboard here, you can see uh, the wastegate blow-offs for the turbocharger, and you can see they're linked up to that secondary pipe. There's uh, one on each side, of course, so those are the actual wastegates themselves. And then here, uh, the left-hand turbocharger, and then the right-hand turbocharger. Very nice to see all of that. These are, uh, of course, the uh, compressor sides of the turbo. The exhaust side of the turbo is that uh, smaller black element in there, if you can quite see it on either side. It's hard to see because of the contrast. But uh, the outboard sides, these are the compressor stages of the turbo. You can see they feed into the intercoolers. And then uh, the exhaust side of the turbo, which, of course, is just feeding to atmosphere there with the exhaust gas flow. Very cool. Moving toward the back, a better look at the rear suspension now. Everything's black in here, so the contrast is a little bit challenging, but multi-link rear suspension, as you can see here on the right rear. Very cool. And then there is your half shaft there coming out of the back of the differential there, which is linked up to the gearbox, of course, giving you drive. And uh, these half shafts, I don't believe, or maybe they do. Uh, yes, they actually do rotate as I spin the uh, rear axle around, so we do have some rotating parts going on here with those rear half shafts. Very cool to see. 
Uh, what you don't see mounted inboard on these cars, unlike some earlier cars from the 70s, you don't have any inboard brake discs. All of the uh, braking was done inside the wheels there. Can't quite see that because the uh, inner surfaces of these rear wheels are so deep set and the uh, front wheels are not all that much better in that regard, but uh, you would have had your discs mounted inside the wheels in a very much conventional location as we would see in the modern era. This uh, above view, you can see just uh, how big those radiators are and how big the intercoolers are. There's the radiator forward and then the intercoolers rearward. Lots and lots of cooling air going in to cool that intake charge, which of course means everything. If you can get the intake air cooler, it means that you can get more power. So very important there, cooling and of course these engines being turbocharged, compressing all that inlet air, they generate a lot of heat anyway. More details there evident on the other side. There's a spring linkage there for your throttle cable. Remember, no fly-by-wire anything in these days, so everything done mechanically. Lots and lots of detail going on, and of course we would expect nothing less than that from a company such as Exoto. Those clear lines up there, those are some more fuel injector lines. And then coming back to the other side of the engine, there's a belt there running uh, the camshafts. Very cool. Fuel tank again. There's your roll bar which is uh, still pretty much in the same place as it always was. Distributor there on top, and that is uh, also connected to that control box that we talked about before. So there's your electronic fuel injection and ignition timing. Very cool to see all of that. I like also you have these little straps on the sides of the fuel tank, this particular one holding the throttle cable, as you can see there. And then, of course, uh, we would have a shift linkage as well. Uh, can't quite follow that shift linkage all the way through, but it is there, there's the stick, and then there's the, the gear linkage, and I uh, believe we might be able to see a little glimpse of it coming out uh, from the side of the fuel tank. There we go, that silver line, that's uh, more shift linkage going back in the car. It doesn't seem to follow all the way back to the gearbox, but uh, it is there, and uh, of course you would have that going back to the gearbox, so the driver could actually change gear. Very cool. Now taking a look at the underside of the car, here we go. You see that we have what appears to be a flat profile when we look at it from this view, but as we come above, you can see that it is very much an inverted airfoil. That is the ground effect going on. You can see basically no impediment as the air comes underneath either the nose of the car or just in front of the side pods here, but immediately it gets squeezed into those tunnels and then it expands and accelerates out the back and creates a lot of negative pressure at the rear of the car there. So yes, Lots and lots of downforce being produced by this car. Very cool. Other information about the model. There is the uh, model number of this one. It's the Renault RE20 in 118 by Exoto. And there it is, Exoto 1999. Very cool. Very, very nice. So it is an older Exoto. But, uh, yeah, still very nicely put together, as we have seen so far. But, yes, that is just the under tray profile of one of these cars. That's what ground effect looks like in practice. doesn't look all that much different from a modern Indy car. The Dallara IR18 looks a lot like this on the underside. And, again, if Formula One wants to solve its dirty air problem once and for all, perhaps a 2021 Formula One car will look something like this as well. But this is what ground effect was in its first iteration back in the late 70s and early 80s. All in all though, I've got to say this is a pretty cool model to have. Uh, perhaps it's not something for everybody. Uh, maybe if you're more of a fan of the more modern cars, uh, say in the last 20 years rather than the last 40 years, maybe you'd want to pass this one up. But at the same time, it's an Exoto model. It's pretty nicely put together. The only real flaw on it uh, in this particular one is the slightly wonky front wing, as we can see here again with that left side main plane just kind of twisted up a little bit. But again, I think we can excuse that and we can say that Rene Arnoux, he uh, accidentally hit a curve a little bit too hard. But again, for the most part, this is a pretty good model. And again, it depends on what you want to collect. It depends on what you want your collection to look like as well, in terms of the errors that you represent. But yeah, for the most part, I do like it. We'll stop the rotation and uh, we'll get the car dressed up once again. Bodywork goes on in the same way as in which it came off, just in reverse. Line up the uh, roll hoop there with the little gap in the top side bodywork, which, uh, by the way, is not finished underneath. Line it up. And drop it down like so. And, uh, yeah, 
that is pretty much all she wrote in terms of the 1980 Renault RE20. It's a very nice car. I do like it a lot. And again, I've had it for a while, but uh, it does look quite nice goes on display every once in a while and I figured that uh, some of you might appreciate this look at a Formula One car from the first time that we dealt with turbos in the early 1980s. Did they do it better back then? Uh, you can argue yes and you can argue no. Yep, these cars looked a lot better, they sounded a lot better. Of course, the performance nowhere near what it is today in 2019, but that's also because they just didn't have the same sorts of technology that we're privy to today. But nonetheless, very cool car. Not the best competition history in terms of winning championships or anything like that, but it's a car that was driven by Jabouille, Prost, and Anu. So, of course, you got some very famous names going on with that one. So, if you are in a position to get one of these, very cool. I like mine quite a lot. And, of course, it's an Exoto, so you can't really go wrong when it comes to that particular name in the model car hobby. Until next time, though, I do hope that all of you quite enjoyed this one. A little bit of a change of pace in terms of the, some of the other cars that we've looked at lately. But, until next time, I do thank you all very much for watching. Ferrari Man 601 saying thanks, and, of course, we will see you soon.